Hello there, my name is John o. Taylor, and uh, I'm one of the teachers at Oxford University um, and thank you so very much for watching this video. Um, what I'd like you to get out of it is two things really. The, the first is to have a better understanding of how Oxford goes about deciding and identifying students that it feels would really um, thrive um, at the university. And the second is to get you to think a little bit more about um, some of the skills that historians use and the ways in which historians can use sources from the past to have a better understanding of history. So the talk is going to come in uh, three main sections. The first is um, talking through a little bit about how we identify students that we feel would do really well at Oxford. Um, and then we're going to turn and uh, think a bit about historical sources, um, documents or um, artefacts from the past that allow us to get a better understanding of, of how people lived um, in different parts of history. And then finally, I want to close by um, just directing you towards some resources that you should be able to access from home, or school or college. Um, and these resources have been um, selected because I think they can help students to think through um, history in new and different ways and perhaps expose you to different ideas um, that might uh, spark an interest with you. Okay, let's start then with this long list. Um, so this list um, details the, the criteria that the history faculty uses when assessing applications. Um, and I won't go through it um, in great detail at this stage, but I think we can agree that some of the things on this list seem um, quite obvious and straightforward. So a capacity for hard work, we want students that are able to devote time and energy to thinking about the past um, in new ways and an enthusiasm for history. That's something that very often people demonstrate in their personal statements um, or the reference that their teacher gives them. We really want to work with students who are as excited about studying the past as we are. But some of the things on this list are a little bit more obscure and um, perhaps aren't immediately obvious. And I want to just pause with the, the idea of conceptual clarity and what does it mean to have conceptual clarity um, as a student. So to begin with, I think it could be quite helpful to think about what are some of the historical concepts that you may have come across um, during your studies. And it might be worth just spending um, a few seconds thinking about what are some of the big concepts, big ideas that you've encountered in your studies. And this is a question that anyone who studied history um, should be able to have a go at answering. It doesn't matter whether you've studied very modern history or um, something many hundreds of years ago, it's likely that you'll have encountered concepts um, in your studies. So why don't we take uh, just a few seconds to think about that um, while I have a cup of tea. <laughs> Okay, well, these are just some examples that I had that came to mind. Um, and I hope they give you um, a taster of, of how broad the, the idea of concepts can really be. So um, I've thrown up some pictures uh, that sort of uh, are associated with different concepts. So uh, we've got fascism and communism at the top, um, two really big, uh, powerful political ideologies um, that influence so much of 20th century history. And then um, working from left to right along the bottom, we've um, got a picture of a king and I selected that um, as an example of the divine right of kings, um, a concept that's been really influential um, throughout much of history. And then we've also got a picture of Emmeline Pankhurst being taken away um, by the police in 1914. And I thought this spoke to the concept of feminism and um, the ways in which a concept like feminism has changed over time, um, that the goals and objectives of women like Emmeline Pankhurst are very, very different in some ways to the goals of um, activists involved more recently in the Me Too movement. And I think what we're looking for from students when we ask to see conceptual clarity is the ability to think critically about a concept, um, but also see the ways in which it's been contested so even something like communism um, is an ideology that many of its advocates actually disagreed among themselves about. Um, we can think about Stalin and Trotsky and how they had very different ideas about how communism should be promoted. And so what we're looking for is students to really think critically 
about some of the big terms that they might encounter in history and to sort of dive in a little bit deeper to understand what are some of the principles and assumptions that underpin um, these concepts in the past. I just wanted to pause briefly on this slide um, to discuss some of the sources of information that we use at Oxford when we're assessing people's applications. Um, and so we look at UCAS forms and people's personal statements and also the reference that they receive from their school or college. But we're also interested in your past performance and GCSEs. But also we're very interested and it's really important to us that we are able to gain a better understanding of a person's potential, not necessarily where they're working at at the moment, but where we feel that they could be with the right support um, at university. And this is where the history aptitude test, which is a skills based test that doesn't require or assume any knowledge on the part of the person taking the test can be really, really useful. And then we also um, have the interview, which is perhaps the most uh, notorious or infamous part of the application process. And the thing to stress is actually the interview is only one very small part of a much bigger process. And we're taking on board a lot more information than just how well someone does that interview. OK, so what we'll do for the rest of the talk is just spend some time thinking about historical sources um, and how uh, they feature as part of the application process, um, why it is that we use historical sources um, when thinking about who to admit to Oxford. So earlier we discussed um, some of the skills and attributes that we look at um, when assessing um, applications to study at Oxford. And we found that um, using exercises involving historical sources can often be really revealing. And you're likely to encounter historical sources in two places. Um, the first is the history aptitude test, um, for which there's lots of information online on the history faculty. But it's worth just saying that this test involves looking at a primary source, often a, a written document, and thinking about what it can tell us about the past. So that's the first place. And then the second is often the interview itself will involve presenting um, students with a historical source um, and encouraging them to think out loud about what it is we can take from that source. So I, I think it could be helpful to start out by thinking, what do we mean by historical sources? Um, and I've uh, taken a bit of a, a guess um, at some of the sources that you may have encountered in your own studies at school or college. Um, and so these are just some of the examples that I came up with. So uh, we've got important documents um, like the Magna Carta that we see here. These often feature um, as part of um, history courses that people take. And then we've also got cartoons. Um, so very often people study cartoons at some point or other in their, their studies of history. And we've got uh, newspapers are often a really important and valuable source of trying to understand um, events as they were observed at the time. And then we've also got documents like maps um, and official records, which might provide us with a better understanding of the boundaries of particular territories or spaces in the past. And it can often be quite helpful to compare maps um, of the same area or location over time to see um, the changes that have taken place. So those are just some of the historical sources that you may have encountered with your studies to date. And I think one of the, um, the things that university provides um, is an opportunity to think about sources in new and different ways and in ways that perhaps build upon some of the skills that you've been taught at school or college. And uh, you're presented with a series of pictures of windows. Um, and that's because I think it can be very helpful to think about sources as windows onto the past. And if you can imagine the, the world outside of the window is the, the information about the past that we're trying to access. As historians, it's really important to be mindful of the window that's shaping what it is that we can see. So uh, the window in the top right hand corner uh, that you can see, I often think is an example of a source that might tell you about some people at the very top of society, um, because it's a window that's looking up um, to the sky. 
And so that, that source might be an example of a letter that a king has written to um, a particularly important person in society. And that can tell you an awful lot about their relationship um, and the ideas that they're exchanging. But what's equally important is to think about some of the absences, some of the things that the source doesn't tell us about. So uh, staying with that window in the top uh, right hand corner, that doesn't tell you very much about the things happening on the grounds, the things that ordinary people might be experiencing. And then we also get sources that um, might appear to be very biased or give a very um, subjective view of the past. So the window on the bottom left gives a very distorted image of what's taking place outside. And it's not to say that these sources are useless or can't tell us something. In fact, they can often be very insightful because we get a sense of the sorts of messages that particular people wanted to present, even if those messages um, were very different from what was really happening. But what we have to do as historians is acknowledge that these actually give a very distorted image of the past and then take that into account when we go about analysing the sources and thinking about what they can tell us about the past. So um, this slide really sums up all I've been trying to say um, just now. And it's to emphasise the importance of thinking empathetically. Um, what we really want to see is students who are able to put themselves in someone else's shoes. And it may be that in studying the past, we're asked to think empathetically about people that we very strongly disagree with. And that's important because in order to study the past well, we need to be able to suspend our own judgments um, and preconceptions about a particular individual or what it is that they think in order to have a better understanding of why it is that someone may think something. And that doesn't require us to agree with what someone says, um, but it does require us to suspend our own judgment for a time. And then to continue the window analogy, what we want people to be able to do is to not only look through the window to see the information that a source presents us with, but also think about the window and the window frame and the ways in which the window might inform what information we are able to draw from that particular source. And the, the sort of final um, exercise that I'd like to, to work with you in this video um, picks up on just that point um, about what it is that we can get from sources. And here we've got a graph, um, and this graph is perhaps the type of thing that students might be presented with um, at an interview. And it's a graph that you're not expected to know um, anything about to begin with. Um, there's no assumed knowledge at this stage. And what this graph is showing you is the percentage of men and women in the past who were considered to be illiterate. Um, and the way in which historians have developed this graph is by looking at the number of people, the proportion of people who sign their name on a marriage register. And it's assumed that if someone is able to sign their name, that they have some levels of literacy. And we can see that it starts in 1500 um, and then comes all the way up to 1900. And the um, line on the top of the graph um, is, uh, relates to the number of women um, who were illiterate. And then the, the line slightly lower down relates to the number of men who were considered to be illiterate. Now, I think it's really helpful perhaps to spend a, just a few moments looking over the graph and um, thinking a bit about what it is that we can tell from it. What can we learn from this graph? I think um, it's often helpful to sort of think out loud um, when you're presented with a source like this. So um, I suppose one of the immediate things that jumps out to me is that there's, there are two lines, aren't there? there are, there's a line indicating um, women's levels of illiteracy and a line indicating men's levels of illiteracy. And we can also see that those lines follow a similar trajectory, but they start out from a very different point. So we can see at the very beginning of our period in um, the 1500s, that nearly all of the women, nearly 100% of women were illiterate. And we can see that that's true of many, many men as well. So that we can see that 90% of men were also considered to be illiterate. But what we also need to recognize is that that means that a certain proportion of men, 10% at the beginning of this graph, 
were considered literate. And that has some really important consequences for the way in which we might study the past. It might cause us to think about the types of sources and documents that we're able to access when we study the past. And then this graph is also really insightful because of the way in which the lines um, and what they represent change over time. So we can see in very broad brush strokes that between 1500 and 1900, the proportion of people who were illiterate declined very um, dramatically. And it, it declined particularly dramatically from 1800 onwards. And so we might want to think about why is that the case? What might explain some of the trends that are taking place? What might explain why it is that more and more people and a greater proportion of people were able to write their name and so assume, are assumed to be literate. And then we might also want to think about some of the blips in the lines. So why it is that just after 1750, it appears that there's a decline in the number of men who are illiterate, and then it goes up um, in a way that's quite out of keeping with what had gone before. What might explain that trend? What are some of the things that might explain why levels of illiteracy suddenly go in a very different direction. And some of the things that um, you might be thinking of are to do with changes in um, employment practices. Perhaps what we're seeing is that the number of, um, or the proportion of people who are spending time working as children and are, are not attending school is changing over time. Perhaps what we're also seeing is changes in government policy so that at a particular point in time, the government decided that it would make um, going to school compulsory for particular age groups of people. We might also want to think about some of the differences in the experiences of men and women. So we've already talked a bit about how men as a proportion of the population have been more literate um, and that's changed over time. But we've also seen that some of the trajectories in the graph are also changing. And so there are times when the levels of illiteracy for women decline more quickly than those of men. We might want to think about some of the responsibilities and assumptions that existed in particular societies in the past. Why it is that women weren't literate in the numbers that men were. And what this might tell us about the role or position of women in the past. And so what I hope you're beginning to see from this exercise is that a source like this, a graph that tells us something about changes um, over time in the past, can actually give us a real insight into issues that go beyond um, literacy. It can also tell us something about perhaps the economies of the past, um, some of the social principles or values of the past, and differences in the relationships between men and women and how those may have changed over time. And what this graph allows us to do is see whether students are comfortable being imaginative in their thinking, to see whether students feel comfortable speculating um, in ways that are informed, that are able to use evidence um, in the, the form of the graph in front of them, and to use that evidence as a jumping off point to think about some of the things that may have mattered in the past and some of the big changes that took place. And it's with the graph that we've just been looking at that I'd like to spend the last section of this talk trying to encourage you to think about some of the ways in which historians um, go about studying um, groups of people or societies that haven't left behind written documents. Um, and as an aside, this was a question that was asked at my admissions interview. I was asked to think about how I would study the lives of peasants in um, Tsarist Russia, a group of people that um, were illiterate and wouldn't have left behind uh, written documents of the kind that we have talked about earlier, like newspapers or diaries um, or reports. So let's have a think very quickly about what sources we might be able to use to write the histories of people who were illiterate and didn't leave behind written um, documents. So I have included um, four pictures here of just some of the things that um, historians um, have been using to try and understand people who didn't read and write. Um, 
So starting in the top left, we've, we've got a very famous image um, which relates to the Battle of Hastings. Um, and this uh, serves as a stand-in for uh, paintings and uh, pictures that people may have created in the past. And it's also worth emphasizing that just as we were discussing with the, the windows analogy earlier, the importance of thinking about the frame um, that informs what it is we can see outside of the window, it's also really important not to take these pictures at face value and to think critically about who it is that was producing them and the audience and the purpose behind their production. And then we've also got um, two images on the right hand side of this slide, um, one a Greek vase and the other um, a child's gas mask from the Second World War. And while these um, objects are separated by many hundreds of years of history, they both stand as examples of material culture, um, objects from the past that historians have drawn upon in order to develop a better understanding of people and the lives that they lived. And these objects are often very insightful because depending on what they're made of, they often last much longer um, than bits of uh, paper or the materials upon which things are written. Um, and they also give us an insight into groups of people who perhaps didn't write things down, um, either because they weren't able to, or perhaps because they didn't have the time or um, they didn't think what they were doing in, with their lives was actually of any real importance. Um, and so the things that they left behind, the, the material objects that they encountered in their lives can give us a real insight into the way in which people lived in the past. And then finally, um, I've included a, an image um, in the bottom left-hand side of the slide. And this is a, a picture that was drawn by a child in um, a concentration camp during the Second World War. And I've included this picture because I think it um, highlights some of the particular challenges that historians face when trying to write about the, the histories of children and young people in the past. And so, Historians have had to work very hard at trying to uncover alternative sources of information. And this drawing is um, just one example of the way in which we've tried to better study the lives of children. And then finally, I wanted to leave you with some resources um, which I hope will help you to further your interest in history and also to develop some of the skills that we're looking for in historians. So the first resource is called Oxplore, and it's um, an initiative set up by the University of Oxford. And it brings together researchers from across different departments to answer questions that students like yourself um, have asked of us. So they're often very big, um, open-ended questions like, what is love? Or can war be justified? And the idea is that by bringing together experts from different fields of study, from law to psychology, medicine, engineering, and history, we might be able to think about the same issue from multiple different perspectives. And then students are encouraged to come to their own opinion about which arguments they think are most convincing. And then the second resource is um, called The Conversation. And this website brings together academics and journalists um, who together produce really punchy um, short articles about a range of often very contemporary and up-to-date issues. Um, and the idea is to try and broaden people's um, understanding of particular topics by drawing on the expertise of university researchers. And then I've also included um, History and Policy, which is um, a really fantastic initiative which seeks to bring together um, historians and policymakers, uh, civil servants and um, members of the government to think together about the ways in which some of the um, findings of historians can be used and help to inform policy making today. And then finally, I've included um, a picture of BBC Radio 4. Uh, this is an amazing uh, radio station. It's got a huge amount of really interesting and useful content. Um, I particularly draw your attention to a programme called In Our Time um, and another called The Moral Maze, which often bring together um, contributors who have very different ideas um, and perspectives on the same issue. And it's a really fantastic way of letting you hear different arguments about the same issue and then perhaps coming to your own opinion, being able to weigh the evidence um, in just the way that we would ask um, historians who study at Oxford to do so.
Okay, um, so that's about it from me. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it's um, been of interest and it's left you thinking a bit more about history and perhaps in, in different ways. I wanted to leave by wishing you the very best of luck um, in your studies and also to encourage you, um, if you are thinking of about applying to Oxford, to practice thinking and talking about what it is that makes the past interesting to you. I think this can be a really good jumping off point from which to think about why it is that you might want to study history. Okay, thanks very much.